Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have neuro coffee in hand and that is perfect as usual. Very solid Wednesday coming up. Got some interesting stuff in the clinic. So that's going to be kind of fun and exciting. Um, I had somebody come with a question through yesterday's video in regards to some forehead posture stuff with a wide ISA. And then I got a question from Matt on askbillhartman at gmail.com. And it kind of coincides, so we're going to do a two birds, one stone thing. And hopefully address both of those. So uh, Matt says, I'm working with a client who has a wide ISA that cannot close, showing almost no hip IR, somewhat limited hip ER, limited knee to chest, straight leg raise. He's making an assumption that because of a limited toe touch that, that he thinks that, that his client has a, a counter uh sacrum. And, and doesn't have the ability to mutate, and he's having a lot of trouble um, progressing this person. He's trying some sideline stuff, some oblique sits, um, other sideline positions to try to gain uh, expansion, and he's wondering if he's, if he's on, the, on the right, right track. So, so right away, Matt, the first thing that I would say is because of you, you've got a, a wide ISA, and you've even mentioned very wide, um, that, that doesn't close, you definitely have somebody with a, with a compensatory uh, inhalation strategy on top of an exhaled axial skeleton. So right away you got to start thinking nutated sacrum, not a counter nutated sacrum, because the it just doesn't fit the the, the archetype. Now, um, Matt also sent me a photo of this gentleman, and it's very very telling. And while I don't like to use a visual representation um, uh, as an absolute, there are some things that are that are are pretty clear in regards to this individual. So this person is compressed anterior to posterior like you wouldn't believe and he is conveniently standing with a shaped head and you can actually see the compression anterior posterior in 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 his skull um so this person is what we would say at end game so if you go to a previous video on end game narrows this is going to be a similar uh, approach because what we have is an end game wide there's a couple little differences that we'll talk about um, that will sort of clarify what you're looking at and then we'll talk about strategies to get somebody out of this scenario. So the differences between, between the wines and the narrows as they approach the end strategy. So all strategies that we're superimposing on top of these archetypes are exhalation strategies. So it's very concentric orientation, heavy stuff. So they're squeezing, squeezing, squeezing to try to hold position against gravity. Um, and so what, what you're looking at, Matt, is is uh, the the wide at the very end? So let's look look, look at a pelvis to, to sort of show us what we mean by that. So when we look at a wide a wide ISA, they're going to have the IR at iliums and a mutated sacrum. So the sacrum is going to be forward and the IR is going to be, or the ilium is going to be IR, <clears throat> which means that I'm going to have a sacrum that kind of looks like that. So I'm exaggerating for effect, but that's the the mutated position of the sacrum. At end game, the last superficial strategy that they'll have is to actually bend the, the apex of the sacred down and underneath them. So this is a really hard IR or ER force against the sacrum. And so the differences that you're going to see with the, with the wide and the narrow, so the narrow is already going to be compressed in, the, in this scenario. So these are the ones that look like the true sway back. So you're going to see something that looks kind of like that, where the, where the pelvis is sort of ahead of the femur here. With the wides, because this is the last com, uh, compressive strategy, what you're going to see is they're going to kind of push through the hip. They're going to push straight through the hip. And so they end up with this really kind of hard ER position. So they'll stand almost in, a, in what looks like a sway back, but their, their, their butts are going to be clenched really, really tight. They're going to stand in a little bit of knee flexion because of the orientation of the femur at the tibia, puts them in a little bit of a tibial IR. So they're standing in knee flexion. And where the narrows may be pronated in this position, your, your wides might look a little supinated because what they're actually doing as they're, as they're driving this hard ER through the pelvis, they actually claw the ground, especially with the lateral two toes, they'll, they'll claw the ground. So it looks like their toes got kind of chopped off at the end. They, they, the, the forefoot will look a little short under the circumstances because they are, they are literally grabbing the ground and pulling themselves forward in this compressive strategy. 
as far as the anterior thorax goes, they're still gonna be pulling the sternum down with the rectus. They're gonna to try to pull up on the pubis, but because of the orientation of the pelvis, it's not gonna sway underneath like it would for, for the narrow. But you're, again, Matt, you're still dealing with a massive compressive strategy here. So, gravity is not your friend. Um, this would be somebody that, that if you could get them in a pool to move around, they're probably gonna love that because it's gonna help them decompress everything. Um, I love the fact that you're going sideline because it does help eliminate a lot of the gravitational influences that they're, they're gonna be dealing with. But you gotta think really, really kinder and gentler. So the, the side planking might even be too aggressive because there's still gonna be um, some breathing difficulties here. When you're driving breathing on these people, it has to be the gentlest of, of, of breath. Um, it's not about hard exhales. It's not about being aggressive at all. It is a calm, relaxed, just movement of airflow. Um, you want minimal energy output under these circumstances. Um, very low effort movement. You're gonna try to start to restore some gentle rotation. So you might even just start with, with head turns in sideline. You're gonna start with some, some thorax shifting in sideline, some hip shifting in sideline. What those hip shifts and thorax shifts are is, is a subtle rotation through the axial skeleton. So it's a great place to start. That's why I like to use the scapular PNF or pelvic PNF patterns in these because we can actually help guide these people into rotation again and then just, like I said, gently guiding the breath because again, if you try to breathe aggressively under these circumstances, all you're gonna do is kick on the superficial strategies again. Um, once you get them to, a, to a, a place where you're starting to, to see the restoration of rotation, then you can start to flip them over onto their back and start to work on like ipsilateral connects where you're bringing same side elbow to same side knee. So now we're starting to get a compression and expansion um, almost laterally. It's still rotation, um, but, but, uh, but again, we're, we're trying to induce as much of this, this uh, compression expansion as, as we can. But again, it's gotta be this kinder, gentler um, kind of a strategy. Once you do the ipsilateral connects, you can work towards cross connects. And then once you start to do that, then you can start to use some leading resistance. So now we can bring resistance back into the game where we can get some reaching activities in here um, where you're gonna compress one side, expand the other. So I hope that gives you a little bit of strategy on this one, Matt. These are the toughest ones to use. Now, I, Ivana is asked about how does this wide person get a forward head because they don't really fit the, the traditional position for, for the forward head because what a wide would look like where um, it is a lower cervical extension, upper cervical flexion. So we would call that sort of like a military posture kind of a thing. And so how does this get a forward head? Because they're actually retreating uh, um, well, on, on, on top of the cervical spine. But if we look at sort of the end game situation where they're pulling the sternum down and pulling up on the pubis, what we have is, a, is an orientation of the head forward. So this is not a traditional forward head where we have the lower cervical flexion, upper cervical extension. The orientation of the cervical spine really doesn't change a whole lot. It's just the fact that the head is gonna be shifting forward. What you're gonna see though, because we've got an actively retreated mandible in these circumstances, is the mandible's gonna get, get pulled back. And so they're gonna stand and they're gonna be mouth breathers. They'll stand with their mouth open. You'll see the retreated mandible. And then the head actually just shifts forward. So we're getting actually more of a compressive strategy of the cranium down on top of the cervical spine. So again, not really a traditional forward head scenario. Um, and probably a little bit more compressive than, than what we would see with the traditional forward head. So you're gonna see a lot of limitation in the upper cervical spine under those circumstances because you've got concentric on concentric all day long there because the hyoid bone gets pulled up. You've got concentric muscle activity pulling the mandible back. You've got concentric activity um, coming from the upper trapezius grabbing the cranium and pulling down. So we got a lot of limitations here, which is why we have to use this kinder, gentler approach with these people to work their way out of these things. So long explanation. Hopefully it was making sense. I probably rambled a little bit as I usually do. Anyway, have a great Wednesday. Um, coaches call tomorrow, 6 a.m. Um, post your coffee videos and I'll see you there for, for a great discussion at 6 a.m. tomorrow. Have a great Wednesday. I'll see you.